some of you know that I'm uh, writing a book, actually finished writing a book, and I am, uh, this week or next week is going to be finished with all the final editing, and next month on my birthday, I am going to give every one of you a book. Yeah. I expect you to pay double. <laughs> For my trouble. Amen. Hallelujah. Sneaky pastor. Amen. Today is a Father's Day. We honor all the fathers. Amen. Let's give a round of applause. We have a special gift. Hallelujah. We love all of our fathers, but I understand that days like these could be very painful for people. People who maybe cannot have children or people who maybe have had fathers that they had really bad relationship with those fathers. Or maybe fathers that were there, but they were not there. And so I just ask that the Holy Spirit is going to bring healing today. Amen. That in this day that you will not be reminded of your wounds, but that God will take your wounds and turn them into scars and will take your scars and turn them into stars. We'll take your trial and turn it into a testimony. Come on somebody. Let's give Jesus a round of applause. He is our healer. He is our healer and he is our restorer. Amen. I will take the scripture for the foundation of this message in Matthew chapter 3 verse 16. And this, the scripture will be on the screen. If you're using a version Bible app, all the notes are on the app as well. You can follow through that by clicking on the Bible app on the bottom on the three little arrows for more events. And then you can find the notes and you can have them downloaded to your Bible app as well. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Now there's, I want you to notice a few things is that Jesus was baptized. If Jesus was baptized, you need to be baptized too. So for those of you who are saying, well, I got baptized as a kid, that's what matters. Jesus in here was 30 years of age. The little baptism when you were a kid is great, but the real baptism, biblical baptism is when you make a decision to be baptized. Can somebody say amen? We also see here that Jesus came up from the water. When you were a baby and you got baptized, they sprinkled you with water. The kind of baptism Jesus expects from us is when you get fully dunked and immersed in the water. Amen. And so Jesus came out from the water and behold the heavens were open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove alighting upon him and suddenly a voice from heaven came saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I want you to notice that God gave Jesus approval. God gave Jesus already words of affirmation before Jesus did anything on this earth for his ministry yet. This is an example for all the fathers here as well that your kids need your affirmation and they need your approval not after they bring A's from school, not after they bring trophies from their sports but before they do all of that because that affirmation is the fuel to succeed in life. Can somebody say amen? We have to understand as Christians is God wants to give us his love. God wants to give us his information before we go do anything in our life because that becomes the foundation for our success in life. Can I get a witness in this place this morning? I want you to notice that the love of the Father is the foundation upon which the Holy Spirit descends. Write this down. The Holy Spirit rests on the revelation of the fatherhood of God. The Holy Spirit descended when the revelation that God's love, the love of the Father was revealed, made verbal, made real. It wasn't the love that God had in his heart. It was the love that God expressed out of his heart. Because see, if you know if God the Father loves you, it's great. But it's when you know that he loves you. This is where the Holy Spirit comes and begins to rest on your life. It's good to live a life of prayer. It's important to live a life of fasting. It's even more important to stay away from sin, stay away from the devil and stay away from the world and curses. But all of that doesn't draw the Holy Spirit in your life as much as your reception of the Father's love for you. And you don't wait until you accomplish things, until you fast 40 days, cast out devils, die to your selfishness and then the Father loves you. The Father loves you before that, it gives you the power to live a holy and a godly life. Somebody say amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Everyone needs three fathers in their life. The first one is the heavenly father. People must know that God in heaven to them is a father. 
he didn't reveal himself as a father in the Old Testament. He only gave clues to David where he said, I am the father to the fatherless. Where he said to Isaiah that Jesus will become the everlasting father. But when Jesus comes on this earth, he reveals that God is our father. He says, when you pray, pray like this, our father. I want you to notice, word our indicates we can't just come to God the Father on our own. We have to be connected in a community. You can't just simply isolate yourself from the church, isolate yourself from brothers and believers and say, well, I'm the child of God. That's not how this works. The fact that God is your father indicates the person sitting next to you is your brother and your sister. Come on somebody. Our father. Our father who is in heaven. That means Jesus revealed to us that God in heaven is our dad. In Romans it says that we don't just call him dad, we don't just call him God, we call him Abba which is another word, it's a very tender word in Aramaic which just says Papa, Daddy. It's a very affectionate word of a little child that calls her father her dad. I remember a young man, actually a little older than me but to me everybody's young. Ever since I turned 30 everybody's young. Until 30 I saw old people and young people, now it's everybody young. This gentleman comes to me and he said, Vlad, uh, he says, I committed a sin. Do you think that I lost my salvation? You know, I've repented of it. Do you think that uh, God, you know, no longer wants to do anything with me? And I asked him if he has any daughters or sons. He says, yes, I have two daughters. And I said, let me ask you a question. Have they made mistakes? He said, yes. I said, have you disowned them because they made mistakes? He says, never. And I said, hey, you're a horrible father. He looked at me, he said, how did you know that? <laughs> I was like the Bible says that compared to God we're horrible and I said you see God as a judge you don't see him as a father I said when you have a revelation of who God is as a father it changes the way you pray it changes the way you live it changes the way you read the Bible it changes the way you pray because see if you see God as a judge and you fall asleep in a prayer you judge yourself but if you see God as a father and you fall asleep on yourself you feel good about yourself because kids never feel bad by falling asleep in their dad's arms. God is your father. Can somebody say amen? amen? That is the revelation that you have to get. I can explain to you. I can draw pictures to you. But until the Holy Spirit takes this information and turns it into revelation, it will just be empty information. But God loves you more than you ever imagined. God is madly in love with you. The second father that we all probably have met or need to meet in our life is our biological father biological father and this where things get a little bit tense this where things get a little bit painful for some of us because some of us don't have a biological father maybe he died when you were young maybe he abandoned you maybe he disowned you maybe you have a biological father but he just doesn't want to talk to you there was a lady who comes to our church and the biological father disowned her says you're not my daughter even though DNA proved that he was his daughter and at first it seemed nothing she's like oh I don't care get lost but then it started to sip, sip in inside of her. It started to create hurt and, and, and offenses in her heart. I want to tell you something that if you've been hurt by the absentee of your parents, maybe you've been abused by your parents, maybe you've been neglected, never felt loved. I want to tell you something here today that God loves you. And His love will make up for the absence of the love that you've experienced from your earthly parents. And I want to tell you something that most of the earthly parents try their best. Some of them, the reason why they act the way they act is because they're fighting their own battles and because they actually have experienced exactly the same thing from their own fathers and their own mothers. They don't, they don't do things unintentionally. It's just they're battling with their own stuff. And that's why we have to understand is that God used your parents to bring you into this world, but your father lives in heaven. He loves you unconditionally and don't be mad and don't be angry at your earthly father if he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Maybe one day God will give you the grace to do it right to your own kids. You know when I struggled even with this issue of fatherhood and though my dad is an incredible dad. He's an amazing father but you know you grow up and craving words of affirmation. You grow up craving I'm proud of you and sometimes because we're all different as kids, you don't get those words and you can do all things right 
and you still can feel that in your heart and you know you can cover it with the fact that you know he doesn't hate me he doesn't beat me he doesn't know he didn't try to sell me on ebay or anything like that and stuff so but at the end you crave that affection you crave that 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 affirmation and and if your dad is like ukrainian or russian or or you know where guys are just a little bit less huggy less affectionate you know they're like i brought you into this world i provide the roof over your house shut up brother <laughs> you know i can take you out if you keep complaining <laughs> and stuff and so and when, when i got married i had this situation where me and my wife went to japanese restaurant and uh i grew up uh with olive garden appetizers well, the word appetizer to me is something that could fill you completely because you know Olive Garden appetizers, you can feed your whole family tree with that one salad because it keeps coming every single five minutes. And then after you ate the salad, you're like, no, I don't want the meal, I don't want the sweets, another salad, please. So, but if you go to some of these Japanese restaurants or these sushi places, they don't bring you a huge bowl of appetizer. They bring you this big bowl and you, your heart gets excited until you sneak in inside and you find out they picked six leaves from the backyard and sprayed something little drops on it it looks amazing on instagram but it doesn't satisfy your appetite the first time i saw that i was angry i looked at my wife and i said this is why i don't like sushi i love me some olive garden because i go in go in there and the appetizers make me full but see you have to understand one thing about appetizers they're never meant to make you satisfied they're meant to wet your appetite for the real meal that's coming see your parents god sent your parents as an appetizer of his love not to make you satisfied but to make you wetten your appetite for his love and some of your parents they are like olive garden appetizer oh smooshy lovey-dovey emojis every day gifts amazing and you're like man i almost don't need the love of god because they love me so much that is awesome but some of our parents are japanese <laughs> You get just a little bit and you're like man I want some more and then you're holding that dad and mom responsible like man give me some more give me some more but they ain't gotten anything more this is where you have to understand God sent your mom and your dad not to replace God but to prepare you and make you hungry for God somebody give God a praise right now hallelujah and I'm gonna tell you something if you begin to thank your father thank your mother for what you already received from them even if it's six leaves sprayed with a little sauce and you say it's preparing me to see God like never before see because I received less I hunger more for God the secret of my hunger is I didn't get everything from everybody and it's okay they're not God they're not eternal they can't be there for me all the time I use what they got they quicken something inside of me that I pursue God now and I say God I expect so much more I expect less out of them and more out of you because see, some of you you do the opposite you expect everything out of them and expect nothing out of God today a switch has to happen come on somebody there is so much there is so much that God has for you but you're too busy trying to squeeze stuff out of your parents whatever they gave you receive that if they gave you no appetizer at all there is an entree that's coming and there is sweets that's coming after that that chocolate cake listen that, that thing is coming it's gonna make you spiritually so blessed and full in Jesus name a lot of men and women who make great difference in this world they stepped over the fact that they didn't receive certain things from biological fathers and mothers the best fathers in this room will still not going to be what God can be can I give you something? God doesn't attach a blessing to your life based on the quality of a father you had. He attaches a blessing to your life based on the quality of your attitude to the father you have. God says out of 10 commandments only one commandment where he says I will give you a long and good life based not if you had a good dad if you had a good respect toward your dad. Your dad might have not been there. He might have not been perfect. You might have still things battling with because of what was happened. But if you have a good attitude, if you say, I didn't choose this situation, but I choose my reaction, God says, I'll bless you. I will pour out the windows of heaven and I pour blessing on you. And people will look at you, but you didn't come from the right family. Yeah, but I had a right attitude. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
the third father the third father everyone needs is the spiritual father and the spiritual father is is like a coach and maybe you're here today and you have a person that your physical father your biological father wasn't there but probably somebody took in the role maybe your uncle maybe your stepdad maybe a coach maybe a teacher a pastor a mentor somebody who came in and took the role and fathered you and helped you we call them spiritual fathers sometimes they can be younger than you sometimes they can be older than you sometimes God will father you through a spiritual father who you actually even never met he will use different people in your life what I want to encourage you with today is this just because you didn't have maybe a perfect relationship with your biological father God can still take you to your destiny if you allow someone else to come who probably is already in your life and allow them to speak into your life father you mentor you correct you sometimes and give you affirmation in your life and don't just walk around and saying you know what my, my, my dad my, my this and that no no receive what God has given you the word coach comes from the original word where it's something or someone that carries a valuable person or a valuable thing from one place to another and if you see it the picture behind me it, this is what coach is it's it's like an uber it's like a it's like taxi if you want to go from point a to point b in life if you want to go from a bad marriage to a great marriage you need a spiritual father you need somebody who can help you there. You, if you need, you need, if you want to go from poverty to prosperity, you need somebody who will take you there. I'm thankful to God that God has given each one of us those people. Now, can I give a little uh, side note? It's important that you don't just call somebody your mentor, but you actually follow through with what they advise you with. We live in the generation today, it's become sexy. It's become popular to post my mentor he is my mentor she is my mentor but they don't do nothing now I love the idea of having a mentor that is great instead of posting that you have a mentor let your life confirm you have a mentor Come on. Come on. let's imagine let's imagine that you walk into the gym and you're slightly overweight let's say or uh, maybe a little bit further down the scale and and you, you and you, you got a great fitness trainer one of those guys that goes poof, buff I mean muscles everywhere and so you come in and you stand up and they are your trainer you take a picture a poster online everywhere my trainer now that is great the only difference is the trainer is fit and you're fat so instead of saying that's your trainer maybe hold off with the pictures that that's your trainer get on the meal plan that your trainer put you on start doing those wraps stop eating those twinkies after 9 p.m stop hiding little sneakers under your bed and stop doing all of this stuff and live your life as the trainer puts you on versus constantly walking around she is my mentor we're getting mentored by that really because if you would have been mentor you wouldn't be in this situation right now because a mentor transports you from point a to point b you're stuck and so i want to encourage you that you know people sometimes look you don't see me posting every other week but even when my pastor speaks my mentor but everybody who sees my life they know one thing he didn't make it on his own there there was somebody who held him there somebody who took him there because I focus more on obedience to my mentor versus showing off my mentor let my life bring an example that I have a mentor in my life who guides me believes in me speaks to me sometimes corrects me and tells me to lose weight <laughs> thank you Jesus hallelujah I want to do something special right now before we go any further we have a lot of fathers with us right now and so we would like to honor the fathers we would like to honor the stepfathers or maybe those among us who took the role of the father in your family maybe the kids that you're taking care of are not your biological kids but you took the role of the father in the family we would like to honor you we would like if you can stand up and come to the front we actually want to give you gifts and pray for you right now so let's give a round of applause to all the fathers come on let's come Let's come to the front. We want to just honor you. Come on. Come on, church. You can do better than that. Give every father. Let's come. And you guys can. Thank you. Thank you. You guys.
guys can face, uh, face your wives and your children. Thank you, Jesus. And as you are facing the church right now, we want to give you some gifts. And, uh, and church, if, if we can give them the gifts, you may wonder, let's go ahead. And, you may wonder, what are we giving them? What, what does every father need? Money. So we're giving them today a wallet with a lot of money inside. <laughs> Actually, it's just a, it's just a prayer. <laughs> just a prayer and a declaration and affirmation amen and so fathers carry a burden of provision and protection for their family it's something that even if you're a woman or your wife and you make more money than your husband he worries more about money than you do even if he makes less money he worries more because it's God's responsibility on him and we want to bless that today we want to pray for that today amen Edder are you gonna get a wallet too or I, uh, I'm gonna pray for yours Papa okay go ahead and so I just would like right there where you're sitting Pastor Ilya is gonna lead that prayer that you stretch your hands church let's just begin to bless the fathers right now begin to bless their work Come on, everybody let's stretch our hands towards our fathers and let's begin to send some some uh, prayers from the bottom of my heart let's begin to let's begin to thank God for them first of all and begin to bless them with every kind of blessing from your heart in Jesus mighty name father we thank you for these fathers God we thank you God that they've they've stepped in they've taken a challenge of being the father Lord we thank you God that in this world with many fathers God they fail to do the jobs many fathers abandon their their families God these people they've stepped in and in this challenging world God they've done the best that they can we want to thank you Lord we want to bless them with every heavenly blessing in Jesus mighty name father we want to bless their marriages lord let it prosper god let it god be full of joy and harmony and unity father we want to bless their families lord we want to bless lord. let there be god a harmony and unity in the family lord let there be respect and honor god in jesus mighty name lord we pray god for their careers for their businesses we pray for their jobs father in jesus mighty name lord open the windows of heaven and bless it increase it lord let your glory god be upon them lord bless every word of their hand in Jesus mighty name Lord let them be satisfied from the work of their hands in Jesus mighty name Lord we pray God that your fire will surround them God in Jesus name Holy Spirit that your anointing will be upon them God in everywhere and everywhere that God they go Lord everything that they do that they will be blessed God as a church God we bless them Lord we ask you Lord protect them guide them and lead them God let them be God let them reflect you the perfect father God in Jesus mighty name let your blessing love and peace and harmony be with them as we pray God for them in Jesus mighty name and the church of God said amen, amen. come on let's put our hands together oh, for our thank lovely fathers guys. thank you thank you you can go back to your seats right now let's give them a round of applause thank you Lord praise God we thank God for great fathers that we have in this house come on thank you thank you Father's Day you know there's on the Mother's Day, there's about, I think, $30 million that's spent. On the Father's Day, it's half of that. Because I think most of the gifts, fathers <laughs> give their children money <laughs> to go buy them a gift. But we're very, very honored of the fathers. Um, I'm going to bring this message to an end by sharing five stages of development of a man. And so this will apply to women. But today, ladies, you get a free pass. Just sit and find ways to criticize your husband. <laughs> I have a feeling a few times during the service you're going to go like this and uh, it's completely fine um, and so men did not know that today you're coming to church to get a little bit encouraged <laughs> but we love the men amen and stuff so we want to share a little bit so the first stage I want us to write this down is the development of men the first stage is we are born male we are born male you might say well it's obvious uh, not no more We live in a generation where you can choose whether you're male or not. And I want to be respectful to people who are maybe struggling with that and have actually con like confusion in their mind and maybe fighting and, and hurting inside and not sure about their identity and their gender and everything. And I don't want to throw these general slogans that people like to do behind the pulpit and not actually knowing people who struggle with that. But the Word of God tells us that God made them male and female which means that being a male is not your decision it's your discovery 
you don't decide to be a male you only discover that you are one you may say how do we discover that you go into the restroom and you discover <laughs> so you are born a male that's very important number two is you become a boy after that a boy is a selfish kid a boy you may say what is the difference between a boy and a man well we're gonna see right now a boy is someone who is passive a man is assertive a boy lives for a moment typically for the weekend a man plans for the future a boy looks for a girlfriend man looks for a wife a boy loves to speak man acts a boy is possessive and controller a man is protective a boy plays games a man shoulders responsibility a boy tells others he's a man a man quietly lives it a boy makes excuses man makes progress a boy makes demands a man serves other people a boy lies and cheats and deceives but a man tells the truth his word is his bond even if it hurts him even if it embarrasses him even if it makes him feel bad a man knows one thing his value and worth is never determined by his gifts it's not determined by his talent but his money is determined by his integrity and your integrity is as good as your honesty when you are a boy people are fed up with you when you are a man people are fed by you a boy is somebody who lives in the flesh is guided by the flesh you can be 24 and be a boy you can be 40 and be a boy or you can be 12 and be a boy but there's one characteristic about boys is people that are close to them that know them not those that see them on Instagram and Facebook and see them from a distance but people that know them typically are fed up with them they're fed up with their lies they're fed up with them playing games they're fed up with them not being consistent they're fed up with their laziness they're fed up with their addiction to the remote control they're fed up with them being on their phone they're fed up with them not reading the bible not praying they're fed up with them not following god not leading the family they're always fed up but a man a real man he is led by the spirit of god which means that he develops a fruit of the spirit what does the fruit does feeds other people now this man may impress the world but his family is fed by him a boy impresses the world but he can never impress his family because see your family is not impressed by your games people that know you close friends they're not impressed by your skills or your gifts they're only fed by your character or fed up by lack of it come on somebody this is not a good time to look at your husband not a good time to look at your husband i see some wives not a good time to do that it's a father's day <laughs> number three we grow to become a man so we go from a boyhood to becoming a man I want you to write this down you're a male by birth you're a man by choice you're not born a man you become a man you don't become a man because you pass through puberty you don't become a man because you can make a woman pregnant you don't become a man because you got a muscle car and you don't become a man because you got muscles you don't become a man because you got a bachelor's degree you don't become a man because you got a house and you don't become a man because you got awards and trophies you don't become a man because people call you a man you don't become a man because you got a mustache you don't become a man because you started to shave what what makes a man there's one word that makes a man maturity I know word maturity is used as a qualification to watch R-rated films are you mature for mature only meaning you can consume junk in the biblical definition of maturity maturity is not your ability to consume alcohol smoke or watch porn biblical definition of maturity is something different than that because maturity is not age maturity is not academics maturity is not accomplishments and maturity is not appearance it's an attitude that you possess toward the things in life toward yourself toward people around you toward your mistakes toward your successes your maturity is always determined by your attitude if you made a mistake 
I wasn't sure whether to go or not. And we see that in Adam. God gives him a word. You have to do this. And Adam goes into boyhood instead of manhood. Instead of leading his wife away from sin and instead of killing that snake, Adam sees his wife who has a weak moment gets deceived by the by the snake and Adam stood there and the Bible says she, Adam stood beside her when the snake was doing the conversation and Eve is giving him that fruit Adam was not deceived like Eve was so Adam had a choice to help his wife says hey honey um not a good time to talk to snakes put that apple back let's go back let, let me get you some mangoes and some other fruits they're much better Adam st stood there instead of being a warrior he's a wimp instead of being aggressive against the enemy he is passive instead of pursuing God he just kind of stands there uh, you want me to eat the apple okay I'll eat the apple he eats the apple and you see Adam is a boy he's not leading a woman to Christ he's now blaming a woman because when God comes and says who did this not me her anytime a man doesn't follow Christ is where boyhood begins when you ignore your consciousness as a man, the consciousness screams and says, don't! And you begin to silence it. You silence the Holy Spirit. He can't produce a character if he's ignored. You slip into the flesh. When Adam slipped into the flesh, something happened. Is the boyhood begins to be maximized that Adam now doesn't take responsibility for his junk. He blames it on somebody else blames it on Eve and Eve of course she blames it on the snake and da, da, da. and God begins to bring discipline on Adam why because Adam didn't mature see your sin is not the problem it's the fact how you deal with your sin that's the problem temptation is not the problem being attacked is not the problem being assaulted is not the problem it's how you respond to it when the Holy Spirit convicts you, do you silence that or do you say, yes, Holy Spirit? Because your character is developed by the voices you obey. Do you obey the Holy Spirit or you obey the voice of the flesh? Do you obey the Holy Spirit or you do obey the voice of people? A real man knows, I respect you, thank you. But God says, no, I can't do that. If you want to do that, that's your choice. But I am not going to do that. Why? Because I obey God. I love you, honey. But before I met you, I gave my life to someone who created you, who created me. And when I die, I'm going to stand naked, not in front of you, in front of him. So I live my life for the opinion of one. And your character is developed when you live like that. Come on, somebody. Number four, when we get married, we get married, become a husband. Marriage makes you a husband maturity makes you a great husband when you get married you become a husband but when you are mature you become a husband good to live with a husband that a wife thanks God for a husband that the girlfriends say man you got a great husband and it's not because she posts the pictures of roses that you give once in eight months um, but it's actually because it's evident that you make your wife happy the problem that happens is when a boy skips the manhood stage and thinks that just because he got a thing between his legs he's ready to be a husband you're still a boy that needs to grow to become a man and when you're a man means when you're mature when you learn to deal with your stuff when you learn honesty when you learn to take responsibility when you learn the character when you learn to follow the Holy Spirit instead of following your flesh and you become a man something happens now you're ready for one more challenge because becoming a man was hard wait until you get a woman it will take you to another level because see your standard is not your dad your standard is Jesus Christ and you look at Jesus and Jesus doesn't play by these rules you don't like me I don't like you too you didn't satisfy me you didn't please me well <laughs> watch me that's not how Jesus left the example he came to the church and the church was at its worst and Jesus was at his best and Jesus never dumped us never left us never said a bad word never beat us never accused us Jesus was the great husband continues to be there's one thing about Jesus he's consistent we go like this whoo, whoo, whoo. kind of like women sometimes <laughs> Jesus have mercy <laughs> women have roller coasters now men, 
men have roller coasters too i understand but there's one thing that men lack today is men are just like that the roller coasters a wife didn't give gave me an attitude a wife didn't give me this a wife did this that's it i'm not going to treat her well and see maturity in marriage requires your consistency in love toward your woman however she behaves no matter how many credit cards she maxed out no matter how many pairs of shoes she bought that she hasn't wore the previous ones that your love for her is consistent you say babe if you completely destroy everything I want to let you know I'm gonna love you till the end of life when you do that her shopping habits change she changes everything changes I realized one thing about marriage seven years of being married is that you don't love your wife because she's lovable you usually love your wife because you're loving the reason why you love your wife it's not because she's easy to love it's because you matured to love no matter how you feel and no matter what she does my wife doesn't honor me because I'm easy to honor my wife honors me because she's honorable woman if you think that your love on your wife depends on how she behaves you still yet to mature of what marriage is expecting of you it's a boy that says you treat me good I treat you good a man says no matter how you treat me I will love you you must say Vlad but that's dangerous if I say that she's gonna leave me if that's what makes you feel loved let it be does Jesus control us and say well if you leave me I no longer will love you we're afraid to go all out but Jesus says this is where our boyhood dies on the cross see a marriage will kill a boy or a boy will kill a marriage somebody has to die and typically the boy in us doesn't want to go on the cross we guard that boy within us oh we love to see Jesus on the cross real maturity is not when you gaze at the cross when you get on one husbands our marriage can be a heaven on earth if we die wives your marriage can be a paradise if you die if you die to your ego if you die to my way or the highway if you die to your own way something will happen I usually tell guys this either marriage will die or two of you die to your selfishness but somebody has to die it's easier to kill the marriage than to kill your pride it's easier to kill the marriage than to kill the pride but I want to challenge you man marriage is meant to develop our maturity and the way it develops our maturity maturity is it kills the boy in us and we all have it the crazy part with this little boy it gets born every day you deal you deal with it today tomorrow it comes up again he's like where how did you find my address again and he comes back and you got to keep nailing that and that's how the marriage now marriage is not gruesome and painful but I am describing something that in order to live happy everlast uh, how does the phrase says happily ever after you have to put your flesh to death become more like Jesus in order to be a man I gotta be like the Holy Spirit in order to be a husband I gotta be more like Jesus and there is one more stage to grow and that is to be a father number five we graduate to be a father so in order to be a man I gotta follow the Holy Spirit's conviction in order to be a great husband I gotta follow Jesus's example which is for me to to die to my selfishness and in order to be one more stage which is the fatherhood of God I gotta develop a heart of a father now a father just because you have children I know that technically you're a father but in reality that that's not what fatherhood is that's a title the substance of fatherhood is not being able to produce a child because any guy can produce a child not any guy can take care of the child it's taking care of the children being there for the children raising the children not tapping out and saying that's not my kid and leaving somewhere else but being there for the kid is really what the fatherhood is it's always easier to make a child than to raise one it's always easier to become a father than to be one Come on. 
Can somebody say amen? Because see, in order to be a boy, boyhood is easy. To be a man is harder. To be a husband, it gets even harder. And then to be a father takes even more because now it's not only your wife that you love. It's not only your selfishness that you abandon, but also there's a little minion running in the house that looks up to you. And you recognize that this little human being, you brought it into this world and it carries your DNA. It's going to carry your habits and you got to watch on how you live. And that could really change your life because it requires something off of you. But you can develop fatherly characteristics without having children. George Washington who was the father of America never had children. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't have biological children yet we call him according to Romans Abba Father meaning Papa. And so and he was 33 years of age when he left the earth and so what I'm saying is that every man sooner or later whether he has children right now or maybe the children grew up and you're an empty nester God wants you to develop within you a fatherly characteristics where you care for other people not just yourself this involves starting a small group this involves leading a bible study this involves finding somebody at work who can't pay the rent and saying listen i'm gonna help you this involves finding kids who maybe don't have parents and simply say you know what let me give you a little thing a thing or two about how to manage your finances how to do this god wants you to develop his nature which is to care for other people this is where the fatherly nature comes into i leave all the fathers with just one advice one thing that I pray for for each one of you to have a revelation that your presence can change your kids more than your presence one of the reasons why parents a lot of times give more presence to their kids than they should is because they want to compensate for the absence of themselves in the life of the kid real dad the best dad is not the one that kids run to when he has candies and presents it's when his hands are empty and the kids run to him. God's existence didn't change me. It's God's presence that changed my life. What, when we pray today, when we worship today, it's not because God exists that you were affected. It's because God became present. Emmanuel, God with us. Your kids don't need your gifts as much as they need your presence. That means when you come from work, you're tired, you're exhausted, you want to get those 30 minutes and zone out and do whatever you want, just nobody to talk to me. And this is the moment where the kid brings that paper. Hey, look! This is the moment where they want to, they want that time. And we have to understand that if you don't give them your presence, you will always later on in life will try to compensate with presents. But they don't do the magic. They can spoil the kids instead of actually help the kids. Because the way God did it to us, He didn't bring us miracles, He gave us Himself and His presence changed our life. Maybe you are here in this room right now and you know that God exists but that doesn't change your life. Maybe you're even religious and you connect yourself with some kind of a Christian religion, Christian, Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever it is. Maybe you even come to Hungry Generation. Maybe you came here today for the first time to see somebody baptized or you just came visiting, you heard a friend or you saw somebody's lives being changed. I want to tell you something. Your life will change if you meet God and you welcome Him into your life and you don't just rest with, with the fact that He exists but you receive His presence in your life through this, His Son Jesus Christ and you repent of your sins. Church is not going to save you. Church is not going to get you to heaven. There's only one thing that gets you to heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. He wants to forgive your sins today. He wants you to walk out of this place knowing that your eternity is secure. And He wants to change your life. You know, to me it's another Sunday. But I know the people in this room, there are people watching us on live stream. It's not another Sunday for them. When we were worshiping, I remembered how my neighbor committed suicide and I've shared this story many times and I failed to witness to him though I felt prompted and I repented many times and I made a vow to God I will do my best to bring as many people to Christ as I possibly can and as I was worshiping the Lord flashed that image and he said Vlad someone in this room might be going through the worst day of their life it's another Sunday for you for them it's death or life today I'm going to preach hell hard and Jesus good. Eternity is very long but for some of you today this is your last moment to meet God. 
I never say that usually. But I know that this is somebody's moment to find Jesus today. You're ready. Your heart is pounding because God is knocking. God is waiting for you. He wants to change you. He wants to transform you. He's been waiting for this day. It's not just another Sunday service. It's the Father's Day where the Father is welcoming his kids and says, come to me. I won't judge you. I already judged my son. I want to forgive you. I want to restore you and I want to slap that devil out of your life. In Jesus name. I want us to rise to our feet. As the worship team is going to sing, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to open this altar right now. I want to be here. As the team is coming up right now, if you need to give your life to the Lord, just come. If your world is falling apart and you need to encounter God today, maybe you walked away from Jesus, you need to rededicate your life to Christ. As they're going to sing, church, we're going to take about a minute or two, we're going to sing. If the Lord is calling you, just come. Leave your seat. Don't worry what people think about you. Or how many times maybe you've been here already. You come to God. You come to Jesus. If you're watching us on live stream right now, Jesus is calling you home. He wants to forgive you of your sin. Right there in the comment below, you can comment that I want to accept Christ. And we will reach out to you right there, right now. And begin to pray with you that Jesus will come into your heart. Church, let's just create an atmosphere right now where people can come to know Jesus. If you brought a friend with you, you can come with them right now so they can receive Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about. People meeting Jesus. Come on church, let's just lift them up right now.